Christ is risen. Christ is yeah, he did. Oh, man, it's Easter. We are here in resurrection. We've just sprinted through the morning dew with John and Peter after Mary's unfathomable discovery that the tomb is empty. Resurrection. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. So we know it's Easter. But man, if I'm honest about my life right now and about what the world is like right now, I got a whole lot of Good Friday, Good Friday energy like still going on in me. And what I mean by that is like life feels like a lot right now. And it has for a while. And some of it is like the big picture, like state of our world and country kinds of things that is affecting us. Like I realized, like I've barely had anyone over for dinner like since COVID because COVID and everything is different because of COVID and that is still so much to process. And I feel like I don't know how to like do friendship anymore. Like how does that work like since COVID? And that's hard. And then there's the whole like what do we do about the chasm of political po polarity that has like issues that should be basic human rights issues that we all care about that are being leveraged to divide us, right? Why are we trying to regulate women's bodies and who gets to wear dresses and whether or not someone has access to healthcare to support their gender identity? Just to name a few, right? Um, and then there's the war in Ukraine and there's climate change and signs of it all around us. And like, that's just like some of like the background noise that we're living in and we still have all the personal stuff that we're facing too, right? So they're also like beautiful things. I know there are beautiful things in my life too and in the world too, right? But it still feels, for me, it still feels like Good Friday. There's this heavy presence of what feels like death and pain and despair and futility and exhaustion and disorientation. Happy Easter, <laughs> right? And I share that simply to be honest. And by doing so, I just want to make room for your honesty. That even though Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. indeed, it's okay if you're still feeling Good Friday vibes too, okay? So let's, let's let that be okay as we just start the sermon time together, okay? And, man, we have had a fruitful, intense, and intentional Lenten journey together. If you missed it, Here's the sermon series that has guided our work these last six weeks and also where we're headed today. Okay, so let's catch up. These 40 days of Lent here at Saw House, we want to put into practice a more honest spirituality. We'll do it by exploring a way of living that has led to remarkable healing and transformation, the kind Jesus taught us. It's a global movement fueled by humility and grace lived in beloved community that began in the 1930s. It's the 12-step recovery program, as articulated in the so-called Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 steps are a practical way for individuals in regular meetings and with the support of a sponsor to live and work through addiction. It began with alcohol, but today, these same 12 steps are used across the globe for dozens of addictions, from codependency to hoarding, compulsive eating to workaholism, as well as groups for family members and loved ones. These steps work. If you're newer to the 12 steps, here are two things you need to know about why we'd spend Sunday morning sermons exploring the 12 steps. First, the message of Jesus and the 12 step message are largely the same message, which we'll see each Sunday. The second, the 12 steps are for all of us because we all have our own substances and behaviors that we seek out to cope. They bind us, which is the root of the word addiction. We can become bound to lots of things, food, control, we worry, we overwork, overplan, over everything. There's alcohol, pot, scrolling on our phones, shopping, sex, exercise, so many things. These things can be good to comfort, soothe, and help us, but they can cross a line when they become unhealthy for us. The New Testament calls them our demons, those things we reach for that have such control over our lives, our behaviors, and our actions. The 12 steps can be used for any unhealthy coping tool, anything that we use to avoid trauma or uncomfortable feelings. And it begins by admitting we are powerless in step one, I can't. Then we're open to a power outside of ourselves that will restore our sanity in step two, God can. In step three, we make a decision to hand our lives over to the care of God. It's the moment of open-handed surrender. I think I'll let God. And then we keep dancing 
the open hand three-step waltz of I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. As the steps four through 12 open us to vulnerable self-work, making amends for the harm we've caused, practicing prayer and contemplation and a rigorous honesty with self for ongoing health. So friends, what binds you? What are your demons? What do you need to let go of? Let's open our whole selves to God now. For Lent at Salt House is I can't. Steps toward a more honest spirituality. Man, please go back and watch or listen to those sermons if you missed them to learn more about those 12 steps and how we talked about them, especially go and listen to Dean Robertson's story. He's a part of our community. He shared about his experience with the 12 steps. Just beautiful. So yes, as we began this journey of a more honest spirituality, I was so enthralled by how profoundly the 12 steps really do invite us to live the life of Jesus. As the video says, they're just so similar. And then as we got into it, it was even more compelling. And also, I found the steps really hard, like even as they do invite us into the life of Jesus. And I wonder how about you? For those who've been around, as you reflect back, that was hard, intentional work this Lent, yes? And maybe you're nodding because you're like, yeah, I didn't even do it because it was so hard, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I get it. And I want to call that out as well. To be honest about that, how that's okay. We didn't set out to like complete the 12 steps. We would need sponsors and groups to, be that, to let that be our work together. But we did it to learn about this way that is available to us and to let the Spirit nudge us toward these practices which we had the chance to do and really, we aimed to each name our own powerlessness, our addictions. And if that's as far as you got, like, well done, okay? So even as I say all this, like, for me, though, even this week, I struggled because I didn't want to feel stuck in that Good Friday energy. And I wanted to feel, like, well, I wanted to feel really good with, like, a really good, like, shiny, sparkly Easter sermon. You know, like, ah, doesn't this feel great? Um, I also wanted to have a really fantastic story about how I fulfilled all of these 12 steps this Lent <laughs> and all the things that I learned and how I'm now like a better person, but I don't have that story, right? And then as I was like wrestling through all that, I was like, oh snap, there it is in me. Like that, that's my addiction. Like I wanted to be, I want to be really good at all the things. And I'm, so that's my powerlessness. Like I'm powerless to being good enough. And there it was, like, this week for me, my addiction trying to control my sermon about addictions. And um, it was very meta. And just look at how sneaky our addictions are, right? So thanks for coming. I have nothing to say about Easter. <laughs> okay, I do. But I just needed to start here with my raw reality that I still feel very much in process with all of this and that life is a lot right now. And so I'm preaching from my Good Friday spot and I name it out loud to invite you to be honest about bringing your own Good Friday energy along with us, as well as your own ways in which your neuroses and addictions may also be doing their thing this week, too. So bring it all with us, okay, into what resurrection means for us now. You game? All right, let's do it. So let's turn to our final step of the 12 steps and find its connections to resurrection. So if you are keeping track, you know that we have one step left, right? And here it is. Let's read it together. Step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Let's read it one more time. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. You can hear how this is like the conclusion statement, the like, so now what of this 12 steps naming, kind of what should have happened and then where we go from here. Notice there are three components to it. Having a spiritual awakening, carrying the message to others, and practicing the steps in all our affairs. So it's awakening, sharing, practicing. Awakening, sharing, practicing. So we're going to get to all of them, but let's start with that spiritual awakening. As it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, notice, isn't it something that these steps assume that working the steps will lead to a spiritual awakening? Like these steps are not inherently faith-based, 
And yet, spiritual awakening, part of the process. Bill W., the accredited author of the big book and the source of the 12 steps, he was very clear about this, that a spiritual awakening is necessary. It, do it doesn't always happen, but it is necessary that there is no real or long-lasting recovery, no real sobriety without what he calls a vital spiritual experience. Spiritual awakenings, they can happen like in a singular moment. Maybe that's what you think of when you hear spiritual awakening. It's kind of like, oh, like beam of light and the angels are singing, you know, like boom, like a moment, right? Um, it, or at least like, at least there's a sense of like something happened in this moment, right? It can happen that way. Yet the way Bill W. talks about it, that it's much more common that a spiritual awakening happens over time. Like that gradual shift of seeing and being just how we are in the world. And isn't that true as we consider what spiritual awakening may have been in our own lives? Isn't that likely what we have experienced? I was thinking about how many of us are sitting here at Salt House who maybe never have prior to now been in a queer and trans and loving and affirming church prior to now, right? Or just really with anything, like how we've had, we may have had just different beliefs at different times in our lives. Like, is that true for anyone? I think, yeah, that's like all of us, right? That we, we could go around the room and we could share what has changed in us, how we have lived through spiritual awakening to see the world and God and see ourselves differently. So the steps, they do this or at least they can, when a person surrenders in humility and honesty. And I just, I marvel at that because it just doesn't work for like the math of my, in my brain of like how I think awakening should add up. Like, shouldn't it like be the payoff after like doing all the right things and like the hard work? Again, the narrative that I live in. Not, it shouldn't, it shouldn't work this way. Not a surrender into honesty and into God's care as we admit we have no control and to move toward our pain and our failing and the chaos and the harm that we've caused ourselves and others, isn't it something that these steps moving us toward our pain, this is what leads to spiritual awakening. It's nuts. Like, that's how it works. And yet also, isn't this the very way of Jesus? In his life, absolutely. And most profoundly, also in his death, Jesus, the Messiah, walked the road of pain as in his public ministry, he touched the sick and the infected to heal them. As he saw and welcomed those who had been ignored and ridiculed, as he criticized and protested the power of the religious elite and Rome itself, all of this was Jesus telling the truth of, of who God is. And it was a life of pain even as it was a life of impact and love and healing and liberation. My friends, have you known pain in your life? Really, the question is, what is the pain that you have known in your life, right? And maybe it's even what pain has been in your life this week, right? So honesty is the only prerequisite for the 12 steps. And this telling the truth about ourselves is a painful process because it forces us to stop hiding our pain or hiding from it, denying it or numbing it. And then if we actually tell the truth about ourselves in all the areas of our lives, not just the areas that the 12 steps address, it includes you know, all the glorious bits too, but it also it includes all of our pain being honest and present to our deep grief and our loss and our broken hearts and our broken bodies, all of it. So this is the, the work then that Jesus did too. Jesus told and lived the truth about God's self moving toward the pain and what happened as Jesus did that. The cross. This is what happens when Jesus tells the truth about God's self. We saw it together as we gathered here on Good Friday. The path of surrender into the will of God led to the cross. This was the definitive once and for all moment when God said, see what happens when you move toward your pain. Yes, it can be excruciating. Also, in your pain is where you will find me. Jesus walked these steps of honesty, facing the fullness of pain in the human experience, showing us that we can do it too. And that, we, and that when we do, the grief and pain and failure and harm 
that we bear in our bodies becomes the very place where Jesus finds us if we let him. So this is why the 12 steps assume a spiritual awakening if we let it. Because these steps walk us into our pain and our pain is where we are found by God and awakened. I don't know how or why it works this way, but it does. It's the most gracious and profound mystery that there is. And just marvel with me at how Mary is such an example of this awakening. Mary, who while it was still dark, is the first to Jesus' tomb. Mary on that Easter morning was deep in the pain of death. For Mary and all of Jesus' followers, everything they believed was happening, that God was, what God was doing through Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah, the one who would become king, that they might get out from under the boot of the Roman Empire, that what they did to build a network of people who were praying and healing and sharing what they had and experiencing the Spirit of God, it was all irrevocably over. Rome won, again, everything that mattered to them was over. And Jesus, their friend, their rabbi, was dead. They watched him publicly tortured and executed by the empire. So this is the shock and loss and pain and despair that Mary carries with her as she heads to the tomb. But the tomb is empty. Notice, though, Mary, she still doesn't get what's happening, right? She's still caught in her pain. Jesus is dead, and that's the end. The movement of God is over. Even as the angels appear, hello, she doesn't see them for who they are, nor does Mary see Jesus for who he is when she turns to find him standing there. Mary doesn't see it yet. It's not until she hears the whisper of her own name from Jesus himself, Mary. Jesus is there suffering with her in her pain. Her eyes are opened, and there in her pain, she's met by God, Mary's own spiritual awakening, yes? Notice how Mary, compared to the other disciples, is the first and only one who walks the steps to the tomb, right? She, she's moving toward her grief and her despair and her pain. Mary shows us Jesus' pattern, what Bill W. knew was true, what Jesus had been teaching and living and finally dying for, that death and despair and pain are always the fertile soil of our awakening. For there is where God suffers with us, meets us, and we are changed. And if that wasn't enough, the Jesus pattern that Mary shows us too is how our pain and death is never just death. Our pain always leads to something. Death and life are bound and it's this, death precedes resurrection, always. That's what Jesus did through his death and resurrection, made a way for us into this pattern. It is the pattern of our lives. Our pain leads us into resurrection, death and resurrection again and again. So I kept trying to like shake my Good Friday energy this week and like, come on, get out of it, get out of it. And Yet, as I surrendered to the process and wrote an Easter sermon that did not feel shiny and cheery, this is what I found. That, of course, we need that Good Friday energy, no matter how much we want to ditch it. We need it with us because it's the only way toward life. Dang it. So that's the first part of step 12, awakening, okay? Next is sharing. As it says, we tried to carry this message to others. So also baked into the 12 steps is the assumption that there is this expansion of self to see how like life isn't all about you. Like life isn't, none of it is. Most of the folks that I know in recovery speak to how surprised they were to realize how selfish they had been. And that having experienced transformation and recovery and sobriety, it's like, what happens in them, it's like the first law of thermo thermodynamics where energy cannot really be created or destroyed. It's merely converted to a different use. It's so like that energy is in them. And that energy of sobriety, that healing, it wants to be passed on to others. One way that plays out is that folks keep continuing to show up at meetings. Even when someone's doing really well, they keep going. It's actually said that if you are in a bad place, you need a meeting. And if you're in a good place, the meeting needs you, right? 
how in recovery, folks need to hear the message. They need to see that message working in the lives of others. And if they're going and they're only hearing the mess, it can keep them from finding their way through. That energy and message of healing is shared. Father Richard Rohr, uh, he observes this. He says, uh, that's not actually, that's my note about how I wanted the slides to go. So you can just, you can go to the next one because that's just one at a time. Thank you. That's just what I wanted, just like the notes down. So Richard Rohr says this, only people who have suffered in some way can save one another. Hear that again. Only people who have suffered in some way can save one another. Exactly as the 12-step program discovered, Father Rohr also says, Deep communion and dear compassion are formed much more by shared pain than by shared pleasure. Do you believe that? Deep communion and dear compassion are formed much more by shared pain than by shared pleasure. Isn't this what we experience in Christian community? Not always, but when we are surrendered and disarmed and honest, nothing binds me, I know, nothing binds me to another person more than in response to my struggle and pain, hearing the words, yeah, me too, right? As it comes to practicing our faith, you know, this also points to how any of us can follow Jesus, have faith, practice spirituality on our own. But the 12 steps and the life of Jesus are so affirming in the same way of seeing how we need each other in community to walk each other home, as they say. You may be doing, you may be doing great, but man, I may need you here in my own journey. And there may, may be a time when my questions and my process can meet you in your need. Like, God can be found everywhere, yet there's a unique finding and being found in community. There's this necessary reciprocity, those who have suffered helping those who are suffering, right? And this is so cooked into Jesus' resurrection story. We see it in how this life of Jesus is shared when Mary dares to speak of this awakening that she has had, Jesus finding her in her pain. The only way that others will know this message is if it's carried. And also in this story, I want to acknowledge the disciples, the male disciples, to be clear, uh, who are also us at times. Friends, with how I was feeling this week, man, I felt way more like, uh, like Peter and John than Mary in this. Uh, Peter and John, who they peered into the empty tomb, but they still didn't really get it. I was like, yeah, that's me. Um, that can be any of us at any time, and that's okay too but the glorious reality of how God blesses us is how God blesses us through each other, and that is such good news. Also good news, the final piece of step 12. So here it is. And to practice these principles in all our affairs. So awakening, sharing, and now practicing. Man, I am a sucker for a good to-do list. Just give me the things, and I will work my way through. So when I see this list of 12 steps... I'm like, sweet. I'm just like tempted to like check my way through that list and be like, cool, I'm done, right? 12 steps brilliantly articulate that it doesn't work that way. The steps are lived and practiced over and over. Even as sobriety and recovery have happened, there's no gold star, no like, you're totally done, but these steps become a way of life, right? The practicing again and again, always working them through. It's also a way of being honest about how sobriety is hard. Relapse happens. And again, that's why we need each other in, in community to keep us telling the truth about ourselves and receiving the grace that finds us when we do. And we know how this holds true also to the story of God and particularly what the death and resurrection of Jesus mean for us. Recovery changes everything. Jesus' death and resurrection changed everything. Everything. The way that John, the gospel writer, tells this is with these little winks that like point us to what all this really means. Here's what I mean by that. So notice, who does Mary mistake Jesus for? The gardener. I love this detail and I mention it like every Easter because it's my favorite. Where do gardeners work? 
in a garden. And uh, so everyone at that time with any knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures who would hear the account of Jesus' resurrection would hear this, and they would immediately make the connection to another garden, the Garden of Eden, the story of creation, the beginning of all things, God creating the world, blessing it and naming it as good. And if that isn't enough of a wink to like get folks to go, hey, this is connected, uh, then he also says this. As the text starts, it just says, early in the morning on the first day of the week. Again, when was another time when things played out over the course of the days of the week? The creation, yeah, in Genesis, the creation of all things. These winks are to say loud and clear that this is a new day, a new kind of a week, for this is new creation. We live in a new world where not only, as we said, death precedes resurrection, always, but also death is never, put it up there, there's death is never the end. It is the full and final truth of what God has done in Jesus, that there is no pain, there is no end, no death that has the final word for our lives. And yet also, we still face the pain and death of this world. It's what we call living in the now, it has happened, and the not yet. It is still, we're still waiting for it to happen. It's both, it's happened and it's still happening. The world is being transformed into this new creation. All things will be made good again. And we get to live glimpses of it, even as we live through the pain and wait for it all to be completed. So my friends, where does this land in you today? What is God saying to you? I know you all feel the pain of the world right now. The phrase shit show comes to mind. (laughs) We also have our personal pain, right? The pain in this community. Sorry, I'm just like really enjoying that right now. (laughs) There's like children cheering. It's so good. Okay. But let me talk about pain. So... Here's the thing, the pain in our community is massive. And some of us more than others, we've held each other through a lot even in just this last year. We know that 19-year-old Luke Tyler should still be here among us. We know Iris Wolf should have lived longer than four months and be here to celebrate her third birthday next Monday. Kevin Hofer should be inspiring us on the piano today. Jeannie shouldn't be in the hospital. Others who are home sick with everything from COVID to cancer, we've lost family members and friends. There are broken relationships, depression, abuse, loss, just so much. So my friends, what is your Good Friday energy that you hold today? This isn't the first time that I've known or spoken about God meeting us in our pain, how this pattern of death and resurrection is the pattern of our lives. It's like, I know this, and I know that there's such glorious and gorgeous hope and comfort because of that. I've experienced this profoundly in my own life, especially in the last five years, and I've seen it in your lives too. And yet, like this week for me, and maybe it's true for you, like what bubbles up in me is the, but I am in a new pain. Y'all, man, just for me, I have like all these like gut issues going on in my body that's like wreaking havoc on all the things, right? And I'm still like working through post-concussion syndrome. Our 12-year-old daughter asked us about dating this week, so there's that. (laughs) And I realized, I had permission, um, (laughs) and I realized even as God has been wildly faithful And resurrection and grace have met me time and again. It's like in the face of this new pain, I found myself saying again, yes, but will you find me, God, in this new unfamiliar pain too, this time? And I needed y'all. I needed this community this week. I needed to face the harrowing process of writing an Easter sermon to hear God's yes again. In order to remember all of this, and to remember you, and that God has given us all to each other to weather each of the Good Fridays that we face, that we get to hold each other's hands through those moments at the tomb, whispering each other's names as we awaken and share and practice together. And we get to remind ourselves that it isn't even just about us, but about learning to love our neighbor, about discerning together how we'll participate in what God is doing to help and heal this hurting world that is so much for us, 
We get to say yes to crazy things in this new creation, like selling our land to become a shelter for families and women experiencing homelessness, and starting a reparations fund because the church has been complicit in systemic racism and we need to do what we can to repay and repair. We get to call out the church trauma that too many of us have faced. And we get to open our arms wide to every LGBTQIA plus individual and celebrate their unique blessedness and they're made in, their, in the image of Godness that they possess. So my friends, what pain do you need to be found in today? Because the good news is that we will be. And even if it all feels like too much, and you leave here today still in Good Friday energy, I may still have some too, know that that's okay. It's the promise and the pattern of our lives that if we're in death, resurrection is coming. Because death always precedes resurrection. So Christ will find you. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And death is never the end. So friends, uh, as we close, let's pray together. If you'd like, I invite you to open your hands and your lap, palms up. Just a sign of that prayer and openness before God. God, we hold now before you the pain of our hearts and the pain of our world. And we surrender them once again to you. We may not be able to see it or feel it, but we trust that you are indeed making all things new and that all things will be made good again. So thank you. Thank you for Jesus' death and resurrection that shows us the hope we have as we awaken and share and practice being your Easter people and your Good Friday people, walking with each other into a more honest spirituality today and always. It is such gift. And for this, we say thank you. Amen? Amen. Amen.